All right, everybody, welcome to Brighter. So two big news came out this weekend that I think when you think about them together, it absolutely makes sense for Tesla what's actually happening. So the first bit of news we're gonna cover, of course, is Tesla released the video of the Tesla bot. We're gonna show its improved performance and it's all video in to output out. The other big news that they came out with was they're gonna increase the employees that they're hiring in not only Giga Texas, but also Giga Berlin. Giga Texas is gonna go from 22,000 to 60,000. So today we have Jeff Lutz with us, and Jeff is a perfect person to ask these questions because he has managed factories before, he's responsible for quality assurance. We're gonna ask him what will happen to Tesla's performance and productivity and quality assurance when they start to mix in both the bots and the employees. We're gonna show you a video of Tom Ju talking about what will happen to productivity at Giga Mexico when all of these are coming together. Uh, Jeff Lutz, as many people know, he's a C-level supply chain executive. As I mentioned, he was previously a chief quality officer of some of these Fortune 100 companies, and he's now running his own uh, consulting firm. Welcome, Jeff, appreciate you here. Great to be with you, Bert. So one of the news that came out just this morning is um, this news here that Giga Texas came out that all employees are back at work they're today, their training, their final prep, test production of Model Y bodies, and at least they saw two master candidate Cybertrucks produce an image outside. So it sounds like that they're back into full production. We know that they were down for a couple of weeks here as they were trying to do some refactoring of the production lines. Jeff, what's your take on this? Yeah, I, I never thought that they were going to start production of, of a new product like Cybertruck before a shutdown. So what would be great to understand is, is what does this term master candidate mean in context with re, re, normally it's similar to your release candidate, which is something that looks like the final form factor, perfect looking um, and something you can do photography with and so forth. And then there's production candidate and then you go into ramp. Uh, so it'd be great to get clarification. Joe did a great job. Joe always does a great job posting you know, both you know the drone footage and some insights. And I believe he's gonna publish a video later today in his YouTube channel, kind of walking through that. Uh, but they're out of the break now, they're coming back and they're getting all the equipment ready and getting it started. And I, be I believe um, Cybertruck, you know, mass production start is imminent. And again, coming out of this break, I had never believed they'd do it before that. So uh, I, think we're, I think we're very close to production. It was great to see the two vehicles today for photography. I noticed plastic over um, the seats inside of the car, you know, they're obviously trying to keep this, you know, you know, immaculate, perfect looking. Um, so I, I think, I think we're getting close. It's great to see Austin ramping up again. Thanks, Jeff. Yeah. So the other, um, big news that came out was Tesla bot. We're going to watch this video. I'm sure everybody has seen it, but, uh, the reason we're going to watch it is because I want to get your opinion on how does this bot and the humans will work together in a factory. I'm gonna be doing a video with Scott Walter that will publish that tomorrow and get his feedback and also maybe get some feedback from James Daum on this. But uh, let's take a look at this video. Okay, Jeff, I mean, uh, clearly this is a huge progress. In fact, what, that's exactly what you said. Um, <laughs> your re your rea reaction to this was think less about the actual actions below and more about the rate of advancement. And Elon actually liked 
this tweet that you just put out. Um, beyond the rate of expansion of uh, the perform, uh, how fast the, the, the advancements are, though, to me, when I see this, you cannot tell me that you can't already take what we're seeing now and put it in some part of the production process, even if just some simple thing, it can already start doing it. What was your reaction to all this? Yeah, I mean, it's it's very close to that, and um, what what I find is is just stunning uh, by this is, is again, going back to the rate of improvement. Um, that tells me like, you know, this video was shot, a, you know, a couple of days ago. That means there's there, you know, they've, they've worked on further improvements and, and we're going to see more and more things. I was at the AI event last September, you know, when they were carrying, you know, when it walked out on stage and then they were carrying out this new version, you know, with the new tooling and they had to carry that out and they needed two or three people to carry that version out on stage and they stood it up next next to Elon and to just think that that was basically a year ago you know, this week and and to see what you know how far it's come in a year is stunning so yeah and and there are so many different roles and tasks in a factory the first thing that they're going to go after in my opinion are going to be is going to be in the materials uh, space um, where you can do material sorting, uh, which there's a lot of that goes on. It goes on actually offline. People think of a when people think of techs or they think of gigafactories, they think of car factories. They think everybody works on the line. And when you hear these numbers, we'll talk about in a bit. Here, I think everybody works online. And when you think about it, when you actually go through the list of roles, which I think I'll, we'll go through later, to kind of set up one kind of product line, both in development, product design, and manufacturing you realize there's a lot of different roles. So yeah, there's a couple of roles I think they could get started on um, pretty quickly. And I think the most fundamental thing, I'll probably tweet about this later. You know, one of the things that when I was a manufacturing engineer growing up and I was working on the, the test engineering side, the big thing is around improving productivity. If you can shave a second of processing time off of building a product, that's money. Um, and you'll hear you'll hear Tom Zhu talk about that in a bit. So we would incessantly focus on reducing movement. We would focus on is there ways to actually uh, functionally calibrate and test a product faster? And why am I bringing this up? Well, when you start putting an optimus in the factory and you start talking about station efficiency, what I could see happening here, especially with the the foundation being, you know, generative AI or this real world AI, I could see Optimus, you know, standing behind someone and learning the task. And then I could see Optimus sitting down and doing the task. And then I could see Optimus being instructed, well, what what, what would you do to, to, to improve the station efficiency by five or 10%? What are your ideas and can you can you demonstrate them and then can you do them without uh without passing on any you know you you don't want it to pass on any quality defects while doing it so how would you have those goals and tension where you're improving efficiency but you're not passing on defects and that's the kind of thing by the way w when you're a a human operator in a factory the human operators that are capable of doing that are the ones that usually advance up the ladder pretty, you know, pretty steadily in a manufacturing environment because they figure out how to do the the function better, faster, cheaper than what the, how they were trained. And I think this could be inherent in in Optimus, which is any task it learns, it actually figures out how how to do it better, faster, cheaper in time. Wonderful, Jeff. Thank you for that. It's great that you have the experience working in the in the factory. You know all the different roles. That was fantastic. Thank you for that. So some other bit of news that happened this weekend was Tesla revealed that once the Cybertruck production is ramped up, Giga Texas will have over 20 or 60,000 employees. So they currently have 20,000 employees on site currently. And this is a public presentation by Jason Shawhan, who's the director of manufacturing at Giga Texas. So at the end of 2022, they had only 12,300 employees and now it's at 20,000. And, um, you know, they didn't have enough parking for workers, so they're going to build a parking garage. It's now one of the largest employers in Central Texas. Imagine that. They're already the largest, one of the largest, and it's just going to be increased even more. This, I just like this, <laughs> this image to show you that the Cybertruck is absolutely different, but also wanted to show you that, that basically to remind folks that Cybertruck was created 
to be scaled quickly and manufacturing. And so you you know they they clearly are going to be you know three times the size of twenty thousand to sixty thousand, and um, so this was he shared that information. He had a keynote at the September nineteenth manufacturing conference at Austin, and it's one of the his first public uh, appearances. Yeah. So yeah, yeah what's your thoughts on this? Jeff? Yeah. First off, I mean. A lot of people measure the the kind of the the quote unquote ramp up of Austin in terms of like how many cars per week come out, and I guess the statement I'll make here: first off, hats off to the Tesla team. I, that's stunning. In Texas, I've, I've built a factory, an uh, electronics factory in te in Texas before, and we really struggle struggle to get labor ramped up. Really struggled, and for them to basically inc and go from the you know twelve to twenty kids at seventy percent increase with you know in nine months is is pretty stunning and uh that says a lot about the capability of tesla to attract talent and to onboard talent they've got a, a good machine that's working down there to be able to do that i just want to let people know that that's very very difficult to do people think like you know as soon as you open up a factory and you say you've got all these jobs like you're just going to have lines of people that are applying that's just not the case and and again in manufacturing too where manufacturing has been you know his it has not been a cornerstone of our economy for decades and now there's some resurgence uh, occurring through companies like tesla so that that 12 to 20k is the most stunning thing to me the uh that's incredible that that is a that is an incredible statement about their ability to ramp and what they think that they're going to need to be able to produce in that facility. And again, that's just not line operators. That's think about the reliability lab in Texas. Think about all the different things that they have to do to, to process vehicles, materials, the people you don't see on the line purchasing all the different functions, uh, technical operations. Um, so many different functions will go through in a bit that, that, that is a big takeaway. The asking for the 60 K, um, it's, it's a little bit process related. It's also letting the local government know that they're, they're, they're going to be a major, they are a major employer. They're going to even be a bigger employer. And I think what they're trying to do is they're trying to, they're trying to soften the, the image too, because they're, you know, they're showing this stunning video of a humanoid robot, which is, you know, the read through from people is, is like all the jobs are going away and that just won't be the case. What will happen is, is productivity will improve. And, and you'll be, you'll be able to do more with less in a, in a smaller kind of square footage. I mean, it will have some impact on labor, but, but right now we're not oversupplied in labor in this country in terms, especially of manufacturing labor, we're not in an oversupplied state. And so this is actually needed to expand economies, this, the, what, what they're doing with the humanoid robot. So really big takeaways from what Sean presented. Jason, Sean. Yeah. So in order for Tesla to actually increase the employees, they must be confident because as you'll see in this next video, we're going to show Tom Ju, um, he, he really focuses on reducing the labor costs at the same time, increasing the vehicle production output of good quality cars. And he talks about um, the combination of three things, right? The humans, the employees, with the factory robots, the big industrial robots, plus now the human or robots. He actually mentioned this in the March Investor Day uh, call. So I'm gonna run this. It's about a two, three minute long video. And then we're gonna get Jeff's uh, reaction to what does he mean by all this. I'm happy to share early this morning, we hit the formula mark for total Tesla ever built. And the, uh, the four million vehicle actually built in this factory. Um, when you took a tour on our shop floor, you probably walked past it. <laughs> All right. So it took us 12 years to build the first million vehicle um, and um, about um, 18 months um, to the uh, build the second million. The third million took us 11 months and just shortly uh, less than seven months we built the four million cars. So we're getting better and faster. Exponential growth. Really put all this to the team. So um, what it takes to ramp a gigafactory? Well, if you have a 600 robots, 10,000 trained employees, or 
5,000 human and 5,000 um, optimus and hundreds of processes, you can do it. Sounds simple, but it's extremely hard. So there's two um, key metrics that we predominantly focus on. It is an um, overall equipment effectiveness and the cycle time. Um, in Tesla, um, we're setting the passing grade for our vehicle factories um, with 90% OEE and 45 second cycle time. What that means, um, the OEE really evaluates um, the equipment uptime, the um, machine performance and the quality. Simply put, um, this is the um, actual um, production time on a good quality product versus the planned productive time. Uh, the higher, the better. Um, the 45 second cycle time, that means you, know, you expect every 45 seconds there's a car running off the final assembly line uh, in the factory. Um, and the faster we rent, um, the faster we can get the economy of scale. Um, if you look at um, the chart on the, right, uh, on the left, um, Shanghai um, be able to significantly drop our labor hours per car um, during the rent. Um, the little dip there has happened in the last um, Q2 2022 um, because of the, the COVID shutdown. Um, and on the right is the Fremont um, Model Y shop. Even this is a 60 year old facility, the team there still be able to optimize the material flow, eliminate all the um, single point of failure and drive higher outputs, um, hence uh, reduce the labor hours. Um, yeah, okay, so you can see here, this is uh, output uh, is going up, but also labor cost is falling. And then I wanna show this, which is the 5 millionth car was announced last week, right? <laughs> Gang of Shanghai. So they were, were really growing really fast. Jeff, um, explain to me what you saw there. Yeah, it looks like they shaved the month off of getting to the fifth million uh, from the, the third to the fourth million. So they're, they're continuing to accelerate, uh, which is good. Um, those charts are, are pretty standard. Uh, there's, different, there's different variations of what is done, but I, I wouldn't call them standard. I would call them in terms of excellent manufacturing companies. Here. You know, excellent manufacturing companies will use um, use this kind of data. If you notice, uh, the y-axis is non-existent. Um, they don't want to show us the actual information. The one twist on the left chart is it's a good chart. It's good. It's a good visual for the presentation. What would have been may, may have been difficult to use, and what I believe that you know they may be using internally is something called units per person per hour, or UPPH. And then the, the speed or the velocity of the factory is the UPH or units per hour. But this is fine. Um, the, and 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 it's the same thing in terms of what what they're focused on, um, which is basically um, their output uh, into their labor, uh, and then and improving that efficiency, and then the actual cycle time. Uh, in terms, of, it's not the cycle time to build a car; it's the click rate of 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 product coming off the line. That's the forty, the forty five seconds. The OEE metric is a very powerful metric. And what you would do with OEE is this overall equipment efficiency. It's really really around equipment, but you can also, you know, if there's root causes related to labor, you'd want to fix them as well. But there's so much that feeds into this metric, but you're basically looking for um, what is the, you know, if you buy a piece of equipment and you slam it into the factory, um, you, you, you would, in an ideal state, you'd want 100% output of good product coming off of that piece of equipment or that machine and how close are you to that hundred percent that's the o oee is is the rate of good product um or the efficiency of good product coming out, out of that station um so they do what they'll do is they'll they'll measure oee at a kind of a station or equipment level they'll me they'll measure the, the speed of the line at, at a line level and they'll measure the utilization of the factory either at in both at a line but at an entire full factory level and and you can see they're targeting over you know 90 percent oee industry standard like your benchmark if you're over 85 percent oee so they've they've got the right targets and is the the more you continue to improve that the the cost per vehicle um in terms of assembly cost you know when you take the bill of material and just put it to the put it to the left that assembly cost of the vehicle we call it the you know the berlin cost the austin cost and so forth that will go down per vehicle, you know, every second you can shave off of the cycle time, every, you know, tenth of a percent you can improve in OEE, you're going to take the cost structure down of the product. So it's very important. Now, did you see the part where he said, um, 
5,000 bots for Giga Mexico. <laughs> Let's see if I can cap, yeah. see where I can find that specifically where he said that. And then uh, we'll That's see. 11 if I can months, find. and just a shortly uh, less than seven months, we built the 4 million cars. So we're getting better and faster. Exponential growth. Ready to put orders to the team. So, um, what it takes to ramp a gigafactory? Well, if you have a 600 robots, 10,000 trained employees, or 5,000 human and 5,000 um, optimus. <laughs> <laughs> so he said 600 robots, these are the industrial robots, 500 mm -hmm. humans. And then what happens if you have 5,000 humans and 5,000 optimus? So this was in March. Um, and then, you know, so then, um, you know, this is again recent news this week, and this guy Smoke Away showed that in 2024 is going to be the year of the humanoid robot. Look at all of these employees that Tesla is now hiring. They are hiring these guys now to help build the Tesla Optimus bot. So you can see that uh, software engineers, QA testers, just everybody you can think of. I mean, we're this is a uh, multiple pages long here, you know. Uh, engineering technicians, embedded software, uh, my gosh, mechanical engineers, rotational actuators, 50 plus. Yeah. So <laughs> what do you think, John? Yeah. Yeah. I, you can tell that the Tesla car team, you know, they're, what, what they're going to do is they'll probably open up these positions. And what I can see them doing is blending and bleeding off of some of the, you know, the, R, the auto and the car team, you know, over in terms of leadership positions and then hiring the rest because they don't want to start, you know, they want to hire 60 positions all from the outside. And, you know, that from a culture perspective, you know, you want the Tesla culture to be, you know, embedded in this team. So I, what I think they have to open the positions because it looks like they're just completely tapped out in terms of everybody, you know, is, is just, you know, heads down working on auto, working on semi, right. You know, it's in Nevada. So, so yeah, the, those are all the functions that are needed. And it sounds like to me, um, it's a bit of a timing thing too. You have to think about the timing. You know, Tesla, you know, has been committed to Optimus for over a year. They could have opened this headcount for over a year, but what would that headcount have been doing? A lot of this headcount is focused on the industrialization piece. It's also focused on the back end design piece in terms of like writing the the test scripts uh, in, in software to do software testing. Uh, and to do, you know, to do lab level testing um, of the performance and the software of Optimus. There's things that are more of in the back hand, back half of the engineering process. So I think they're getting closer to wanting to do, you know, instead of more of a hand built operation to more of a semi auto, um, semi automatic operation, kind of like an, a new product introduction or NPI line in Nevada, and also probably concurrently um, building out. Uh, the design for the production line and operation in Nevada. So that's what these resources are for. It, it shows me that they're imminent. You wouldn't have hired these a year ago because they'd be sitting around doing nothing because their phases would have been about a year away. So it tells me that they're they're getting closer and closer uh, to production. What's your expectation, Jeff, on what's going to happen to output, to quality assurance, which you were in charge of? Um, Efficiency, just any all the other things that would happen when you combine bots, humanoid bots with the industrial robots, now with humans as well, and they're increasing, like you said, all of this. Yeah, and I was responsible for all the the manufacturing functions too, and manufacturing engineering. What what I expect will happen is is there'll be um, a hybrid approach for a, a you know a number of years of just starting on small tasks and then figuring out how to get the end to end process working with a humanoid robot on a small task. It could be sorting boxes in a warehouse. It could be, um, it could be labeling. It could be, um, it could be material sorting. There are huge material sorting operations that happen in back rooms and factories and they involved uh, inspection equipment. They involved, you know, operators, uh, manually sorting because what you want to do if you have a high efficiency line running the worst thing you could do is introduce bad material to the line and in some factories i mean i've always been a, a fan of the approach of put incredibly difficult uh requirements in terms of um 
if you have any outliers as a supplier and you send them to my factory, it's, it's, it's going to be a big problem for you financially and operationally, and you may not ever get business. And there's some factories that also, especially in some of the big, big players in, in the mobile phone world, they, they have kind of a, a net uh, over their factory where you know they, they, they look at a lot of this material before it gets to the line. Because again, if you take that high efficiency line down, you're talking about tens and hundreds of millions of dollars of lost output because you know somebody sent some bad parts in. So material operations, sorting, um, I can see those being the first things and, you know, and then it'll just grow from there. And then eventually it'll start doing small, I would say remedial assembly tasks. The big thing is, you know, Optimus is going to have cameras. I believe it's going to have, you know, capacity. There's going to be all kinds of sensors in the hands. And in a manufacturing operation, you know, there's a lot of um, measurements that are taken on any of the fixturing and tooling that's used on a line because anything that really touches the product, you want to make sure that it's calibrated. If there's any force being applied to the product that you understand those forces, if there's any force being applied to you, you understand how even those forces are being applied. And I believe, you know, that they're going to have the ability to, to quantify that, you know, with, with the hands of Optimus. So I think there's going to be things, there's going to be, you know, these aren't just going to be replacing human labor. I believe it's going to have a little bit more superhuman like capability on the line, whether it's taking measurements, especially optics, that's going to be the big thing. It, you know, it, it's going to really depend, like, it's almost like is, is the, are the optics, are they going to be swappable where if you, if you have a high precision manufacturing environment, you can, you, you can swap different optics in and out where you can actually take measurements um and i don't want to get too far too far wonky on this but there's a lot of you know if there's going to have kind of a depth of field the ability to know like for example like in, in alexander's example like is this you know, if you're ironing a shirt is the shirt flat um so i think the difference so in summary i think small remedial tasks that are very labor intensive in the beginning they'll be able to go in and it'll be kind of a hybrid approach material operations, sorting operations, and, and then eventually small assembly operations. But I believe the superhuman capability are, is going to be like, what are the sensors on this device? What can it can detect? What kind of new defects can it prevent? Also, what is it uploading? It's got eyes. It's got cameras on all the time. Can this data be uploaded? So that if, as product is flowing down the line, if all of a sudden all the screws are torqued in one direction, all of a sudden now it's it looks like it's torqued in a different direction. Did that change the performance and functional test down the line? And then can I flag that? Could I now that I'm optimist, I can read that serial number, I can assign it to that that screw position, and I can understand that that is that that is uh that is not uniform with the other thousand that went down the line. This is something humans can't do well, and this is something that manufacturing operations are spending money right now. They're buying they're buying the cameras, they're buying all the optics to put on the line, and that would that could be all swapped out and dealt with Optimus. Right. So the impact of Optimus, which is what you're saying, which is uh, what I love, is the ability to improve the quality assurance, uh, superhuman capabilities, and that's going to be the, the biggest and, thing and later down the line. Yeah. Yeah. And use and its AI to, to <laughs> it's use its AI to actually improve the productivity of the station. Yeah. That is the thing. The, the operators that do that are the ones that advance. And, and think about, and there's very few of them that are actually good at doing that. And so now you have a, all, all optimists are, they're focused on like, how to, okay, I, I do this station. It takes me 18 seconds. Okay, Optimus, could you figure out a way to do it in 16 seconds? And exactly. what would, you can what would be it. the changes? <laughs> I love it. So oh, it's yeah, not just training. Show. It's not just training. It's not just watching. It's, it's going to figure out a way, can it do it better? That's brilliant. Yeah, I was doing a show with uh, Scott Walter, and he said at the beginning, you're going to, you know, the bot's going to be slower, right? It's going to move half the speed of a human. Eventually, you're going to have equal to speed. And of course, it can do one shift, two shifts, maybe three shifts. But what happens when it can now move five times your speed or even 10 times as fast, right? Because once it's, you know, figured it out, they can do really, really quickly. And then, and then be, be precise about it uh, and then make suggestions. <laughs> This is brilliant. Okay, thanks, Jeff. So there's some more news, of course, about increasing of employees here at Tesla. Uh, Alexandra pointed out that not only is Austin going to expand from 20 to 60,000, which we just saw, 
There was also news, many people missed this, that Berlin had said that they're going to double from 11,000 to 22,000. And so at some point, we know that Shanghai is going to increase and all the new factories. What's your best guess of number of Tesla employees in five years? And she thinks it's going to be 300,000, which is pretty well, what one? it's a double of where we're at now, 160 uh, to uh, 100,000 bots uh, by then. So this is the, there's a uh, German article. So it was, this is translated that says Tesla wants to double the number of employees in Giga Berlin. Um, and then they're kind of hiring soldiers with different kind of backgrounds. Um, what else did they say here? So, and then right now they employ 11,000. So that's where we came up with the number of 22,000. And then the other news we got was permits. Uh, some permits have been approved for Giga Mexico. We've been waiting for this for a long time. And so what they say here is that um, so that, that they will Tesla will have to comply with certain regulations during the construction. Oop. And uh, they'll not be allowed to clear the entire site at once. They'll need to clear it in proper in, in certain stages. Um, and then now have 26 months to begin construction. However, there are still other permits Tesla must have in hand before they can do that. So they were still waiting for more, including the land use permit, but at least the beginning has started and they can start now. Yeah, I'm in the camp that, uh, that Tesla is gonna move faster on the Gen 3 vehicle by starting production in Austin. So I'm actually more bullish on the Gen 3 vehicle than I was a month or two ago when I thought that it was going to go through this whole operation of, you know, new site and new product. I, I've said this before. Um, we were talking about Austin and Cybertruck versus doing Austin and Model Y first. New product, new factory, not a good combination. Uh, but if you can take new product, which is going to have a new manufacturing approach and get that going in an existing operation, you know, that is better for the product. It's better for the, the ramp compliance of that product and, and for it meeting its goals. So I'm more bullish on the approach to Gen 3 as a result. The Mexico stuff seems to be improving, but continue to drag on. We appreciate, you know, Soria does a great job giving those updates. And, and, and Alexander does a really good job looking at all of this news input, especially as it relates to like, what are the roles Tesla's hiring and what's going on with, you know, their headcount globally, because a lot of these, a lot of companies look at their sales, you know, divided into their headcount. And, you know, and sometimes, you know, companies just grow and they get way ahead of themselves. And that, that sales number per headcount or that revenue number per headcount goes way down. Tesla does not have a history of doing that. So I think that's why it's very interesting. The data that Alexander is sharing is, it, you know, they're really primed for growth. And I want, I think what I want the viewers to understand is it's 2023. These things have a runway of, you know, 12, 18 months, depending on what, if you're, if you're, you know, if you're trying to ramp up labor for a particular region, or you're trying to get ready for a new product line in 2025, you have to start the work now. So I think people are trying to, they're looking at, okay, how many units are we shipping in Q3 and what's happening? And there's price changes here or there. And Tesla's like, we know where we're going to be in 2025. We have to start a lot of this work here. And this is, these are the actions you're seeing. Jeff, tell me a little bit more about um, Giga Texas. You just mentioned it, right? That they are, they've already started the, I don't know what the word is you use. Is it the test line for the next gen platform? So it's, it's like you said, um, new factory, new product is really scary. And so it's actually a good thing that in way back in March, according to Walter Isaacson's book, Elon already decided to start a test line of the next gen platform in Giga Texas. Can you tell me what you're thinking about how that, you know, what's happening there? And I think you mentioned some of the positives of that. Yeah, I've, I've always been a huge proponent of this. I've actually gone against a lot of industry thinking in some of the industries I've been in, and I've been able to show the data in terms of what, what Tesla is doing is, is they're going to, they're, this is not only a new product, but this is a new way of building a product. So you have a new product, you have a new way of building a product that's, that's pretty radical. What you want to do is you want to be inside of an existing operation that's been properly facilitated and tested, that's got a labor base that's been trained in the Tesla way of doing things. And then more importantly, that's very close, not more importantly, but also of great importance, 
is that it's very close to the management all the way up to Elon because the, 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 the Gen 3 vehicle is the, you know, the, the multi-trillion dollar opportunity that Elon refers to. And if, and if he could shave a day or a couple of hours off of an issue by unblocking something because he's right there in Austin or make a key decision about something, it, both him and his staff are there, um, it, it, makes, it makes the world of difference. This is the difference between being you know, weeks and days, uh, days and weeks and even months late or, or missing a major piece of functionality on a product because you're doing it in this remote site. And then you've got the feedback loop is longer. So in product development, whether it's software development or hardware development, there's this whole concept of cycle time. There's this whole concept of phase containment of issues. Whereas you don't, as you're stepping through the phases, you want to contain, in, in both on the manufacturing line too, you want to contain the, the defect where it was created or contain the problem where it was created and not let it proliferate in the future phases because then it becomes more cumulative in its impact and you want you want less issues as you go through the phases versus more so th they're going to be able to to go probably have faster cycles of learning right on top of their management team and right on top of their best engineers in austin they're going to have faster cycles of learning and they're going to have more containment of, of issues and be able to knock down issues faster so i, I believe that when you're doing an iterative product, you know, go send it to Mexico, go send it to a different place. And again, this takes nothing away. There's great automotive engineers in Mexico. This isn't about that. This is more about as the core of your company, you do your most innovative products as close to the decision-making capability and leadership uh, as possible. And that will give you the fastest cycle time. All right. Thank you so much, Jeff. So, Think about what we just heard this weekend, right? So we have um, the bot demo showing tremendous advancements so quick in what it can do. Uh, that's giving us a lot of uh, confidence it's going to happen. All of the hiring that they're doing for the bots, uh, that's a significant amount of people that they're bringing on board. They're going to triple the number of employees in Giga Texas. They've already started the next gen platform. And you saw Tom Ju saying that what happens when you have 5,000 humanoid bots in the factory, what's that going to do? To uh, you know, even without it, they already they already showed you the lower labor costs, but with it, it's going to even fall further, and cycle time for producing cars will even go faster. Thank you so much, Jeff. Uh, perfect. You know, you have experience at these manufacturing firms. You've got experience with quality assurance. Uh, you've also managed uh, both people and these industrial bots. One day, you'll be able to manage a humanoid bot. <laughs> That'll be part of your. Uh, it's going to replace me on the podcast. <laughs> they cannot replace you ever. Thank you, Jeff. Please follow him on Twitter at the Jeff Lutz. Thank you so much, Jeff. Appreciate you. Thanks, Herbert. Hey there. Thank you for joining me. If you can, please consider supporting this channel so I can keep it going. It's a lot of work arranging all these amazing interviews. One of the easiest ways is just to click that join button and become a member of the channel. Thank you very much. Let's get brighter.